Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek. This is the next in a series of videos that I'm doing looking at some of the most mysterious, intriguing uh, places and peoples in the entirety of the world of a song of ice and fire. And as always, I've got uh, one of my favourite creators here, one of the uh, the OGs in the a song of ice and fire uh, community. Uh, he's been on this channel a few times before and it's always a pleasure to have him. Aziz, you want to say hi? Hello, Robert. Thanks for having me. This is great. I love to talk about uh, secrets and things that are maybe waiting to surprise us later in the book, sort of things that are on the shelf that have been set up. So this is a great idea for a series that you've got here, and I'm very happy to participate. I've got a few fun things to share, and I'm excited to hear what you have to say as well. So yeah, let's do it. Excellent. And uh, for those who don't know, uh, Aziz is from uh, the History of Westeros uh, podcast, YouTube channel, and many other places. You also, I think you do podcast of surprise as well now, don't you, about The that's, Witcher? Yeah, that's right. We've only got three episodes of that one out so far, but we're we're it's a heavily produced uh, podcast, and we're going through each short story one at a time, and then we'll go through the, the books, the main series, one chapter at a time, because each chapter is about the same length as uh, one of the short stories. So that works out really nicely. I'm a big fan of The Witcher, and I'm, I'm hoping it uh, continues to grow as a fandom. It won't ever be as big as Game of Thrones, I don't think, but that's a rather high bar to clear, so no <laughs> shame in uh, being smaller, but it, it's a lot of fun. I hope other people uh, continue to join and check it out. Yeah, there's no shame in not being the biggest TV show in the history of the world. I think that's, <laughs> that's okay. Um, I will put a, I'll put a link down in the description to uh, both the History of Westeros YouTube channel and also um, a podcast of Surprise. I would highly recommend you check out both of them. But today we are talking about the Red Keep. Now, the Red Keep is one of those places that... On the surface, it seems like just one of the sort of the bits of background, uh, a set that they they use um, to allow lots of plotting and all the rest of it to go on. But the more you dig into it, the more you realise that actually this is this is a place with secrets. Now, uh, the first thing to say um, is that this is not an ancient castle like we were talking about uh, uh, Winterfell. I was talking uh, to Professor Castle, actually, uh, a few weeks ago about, mm -hmm. about Winterfell. That's an ancient castle. This is a relatively recent one. Aziz, why don't you kick us off with a sort of just at a very high level? What's the what's the history here? Well, why is there a Red Keep? Good question. Yeah, good place to start. The original landing of, of King Aegon at around the, well, as we date it now, AC1 or so is where the site of King's Landing is. And of course, that being the capital city of sorts, it makes sense to have his castle there as well, rather than on Dragonstone, which is a bit detached from the rest of the realm. It's not as central and it's a good place to go hide or to go have Targaryen things going on. But as far as ruling the realm, you got to have something closer. So he started off with what was called the Aegon Fort. He picked the highest hill near the, the site of the city where it was growing and built a, a, a wooden fortress there. Now, of course, in the long run, a wooden fortress is not going to cut it for the king on the Iron Throne, for the king of the Seven Kingdoms. That is just a little too uh, cheap, shall we say. So they started working on the Red Keep about 35 years into his reign. Now, he did not live to see it complete. He, he didn't, not even close, really. And so he, he died two years into its construction he had given construction of it over to, or control of uh, construction over to his sister, Visenya, and keep that in mind because Visenya and things associated with her are going to continue to pop up throughout this episode. And she also encouraged her son, Magor, after a lot of time had passed, to add more to it. For example, it, it, it wasn't completed until deep into Magor's reign. So we had a whole nother King Aenys live through this uh, construction and it still wasn't done. He did spend a lot of time there, but it still wasn't finished. Now, when Magor ascended, he was not only a man who really earned his nickname of the cruel, but he was a guy that understood that ruling with cruelty and aggressiveness would make him enemies. And that means you have to be prepared for these enemies. And so we saw some of the things built in the Red Keep that we're now most interested in. These sort of, the, the exact sort of secrets that you refer to here, Robert, are the kind of things we're getting into with Magor and perhaps Visenya, because I suspect Visenya had a big hand in a lot of the ideas and conceptualizations 
with regards to the Red Keep, because she's also the person that formed the King's Guard. So she was very big on security and protecting Targaryen power. And of course, with Megor as her son, you could understand that there was some mothering going on here as well, some protectiveness on that side. So a lot of different elements at play. And uh, I'm sorry, did you have something to say? Uh, no, no, no. I was, I was just going to say, uh, I'd, I'd love you to carry on with this fascinating stuff. I, I think the, the only thing I'd add here just at this moment is this is very clearly a decision by the Targaryen kings, the first three Targaryen kings, one after another, to have the capital there. The, they could, as you say, they could have had it on Dragonstone. There was a lot of pressure on them to have it over in Old Town, which was by a long way the biggest, most powerful ancient city that there is in Westeros. And they decided, no, we're going to have our capital here. And what we now know is King's Landing effectively grew up out of that. When you build the castle there uh, and you say this is where the king is going to reside, then a huge amounts of, of uh, sort of service industries and people will start to gravitate towards it. And that is what created King's Landing. But uh, I, I interrupted you when you were midway through talking about um, uh, Visenya and the, the secrets uh, and, yeah. and what this might be. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about what uh, particularly what Ma Magor was up to. Yeah, well, yeah, that's that's a great point you made too about the where the capital was and, and not using the old power structure, starting something new and something more central. That's really important too. Like you say, Old Town is so far in the South and uh, King's Landing is far more central. So not just central to Westeros, but it's closer to Essos too, which I think mm. is, is, is pretty relevant. So yeah, continuing on with some of the, the, the meat of the Red Keep and what is compelling us the most towards uh, looking at these secrets and wondering what's gonna happen later. It was under Magor and her that all these features like Magor's Holdfast and the black cells and the torture chambers and all the secret passageways, essentially either all or most of the secret passageways were built during this time and under their uh, auspices. So it's not really clear that Aegon ever had planned such a thing. In fact, given that he turned over all of the construction to Visenya, he probably didn't give it a whole lot of thought. He probably was too busy with being king in other ways. There's a lot of duties for a king, especially a, a, the first king in a long dynasty. So all these things that we see Varys playing with and with Arya's tunnel travels and little finger leading Sansa out of the castle to flee to the veil and all these little things, all these historical events, like during the dance of the dragons, they all started here. They were all enabled by this construction and this very potent, powerful fortress that allows not only for an incredibly powerful last ditch defense against assault of not just King's landing, but the main part of the red keep, but it also allows a potential escape using these secret chambers. And Robert, I gotta say, these secret chambers, I don't think we've seen the last of, of these tunnels playing a role. I mean, it's the one of the last things that happens in the Dance with Dragons, right? We see Varus use the tunnels to commit two high profile murders and that's kind of where we're left. But I don't think that's gonna be the end of it. So I think that is a, a pretty good overview of uh, the construction. But um, yeah, I think that's, uh, it's, it's really cool. Absolutely. And I think we definitely will see more of these tunnels. Uh, and what we have now, I think, uh, thank you, that was a really uh, good introduction to what we've got, because what we have now is a castle. And I think it's really important to emphasize that this is, we think of it perhaps as being like a palace, because that's what we see. It is a palace, but it is definitely a castle. It's got uh, a keep, Magor's hold fast, which has got a dry moat. It's got spikes. There's crenellations, 12 foot thick walls. This is built as a defendable structure. And it has got all the things that you would imagine a castle to have. It's smaller than, say, Winterfell, we're told, but at the same time, it is definitely defendable. It's got, to, it's got a granary in case of a siege, it's got wells, it's got all the things you would need there. And the thing that we're told is that there are lots of tunnels underneath it, and they, they vary. Some of them are, are you know, 
things that you can walk through that actually are generally a lot of people know about connecting different parts of the castle like say in castle black they've got the, the, the worm maze the things underground people know about them and use them uh some of them are uh really small tunnels just like held up sort of planks of wood and dirt and that you can just sort of like crawl through some of them you have to like sort of side sidle along there, there's there's lots and lots and lots of these now uh, what i would want to pick up on first is this idea that we that people do not know what is there there's only a very select few people who know what is there uh, and indeed um when um magor the cruel had finished doing this then he gathered together all of the people who'd built this this wonderful castle he <laughs> had this feast for them all and for i think it was three days they had the time of their lives eating drinking doing whatever they wanted and then they were all killed. And that, that meant that, so the rumours say, the only person who knew the secrets of the Red Keep was Magor the Cruel himself. Now, there's a, there's a fascinating line uh, in, I think it's one of Catelyn's early chapters when she comes in and she thinks about this story and she says, uh, she thinks, you know, only, only a Targaryen knows all of the secrets of this. Um, <laughs> and then immediately we're introduced to Varys and told that he knows all the secrets of this. Uh, I think it's beyond the scope of this video to speculate on what that link might be. But who do you think, at a high level, who do you think does know about these tunnels? Okay, yeah, yeah. I do think Varys is numero uno. He does seem to know the most about them. And I kind of doubt anyone is even particularly close among living people. There surely have been people who have lived before him that had at least understood some of the tunnels and some of the secrets. And you really wonder how these secrets were passed down, right? Like if Magor was the only one who knew, which I think is probably a small exaggeration, because, again, I think his mother had to know uh, some of the secrets, mm. uh, although I think actually she may have died by the time it was officially completed. So that would be a moot point regardless. But clearly these secrets, whether or not Magor knew them all and kept them to himself, is a bit irrelevant now because clearly whether he passed them on or not, they've been relearned, at least some of them. And perhaps new secrets have been added. For example, the, when you describe to me the passage where you have to crawl down on your hands and knees and there's, some of the tunnels are so small like that, I have a hard time believing Magor okayed that because he was probably the largest ever Targaryen. And it's, it's almost <laughs> no way he could personally fit through that. And why would he design a tunnel in his own escape for his own escape that he himself can't fit through so i have to sus i suspect that maybe some additions have been made in fact maybe some of these tunnels were made uh in in to, in order to determine the secrets that have been lost in other words people poking around in there to figure out all right i know there's a tunnel here let's fit you know there's a secret passage here somewhere and trying to relearn those secrets maybe they just knocked a few walls down so we certainly see that happening after uh, you know, with under Cersei's auspices when they're looking for how Tywin was killed, which I assume we'll talk about a little later. But as as far as this goes, um, other people who know about it besides Varys, I, I would really love to know how he learned, relearned these secrets. I have a feeling we will not get that information ourselves. We'll probably just be permanently speculating on how Varys figured some of these things out. But maybe we get a little bit of clues. I imagine we'll get a little more, even if we don't get the full story. After him, I would have to guess, uh, Littlefinger doesn't know the tunnels super well, but he certainly knows a few things about them because... Well, he led Sansa through a passage down to that um, side area where it led to the cliff, which they then climbed down that cliff that had the, the handholds cut in and then got on that ship and escaped. And there was nobody nearby, so it was it's kind of a secret area. And then we have uh, potentially someone like Tyrion, who has been down there and he hasn't been down there in a lot of places, but he knows a little bit about it. He notably is in a trance, not a real trance, but after he kills his father, he's so wound up about it that it, it, the, the writing shows that he, it's basically skips over it. He doesn't even think about where he's walking. And next thing he knows, Varus has led him back outside. But the point is he knows these tunnels are there. 
He knows that whether he knows the ins and outs of them, he knows a lot of specific things about them. He knows several rooms in which they lead because he's seen them. <laughs> and he talked to Shay about where she'd been led around by Varus, things like that. So other people, though, there's really it's a pretty short list. Um, I think Ari has been Ari has definitely been down there. And we'll talk about her a little more later. Uh, she probably has some insights. Jamie's been down there a little bit uh, when he was uh, searching for what happened to his father as well. But that's about it. I mean, there's just very few people that know much about it. And maybe I've forgotten somebody, but that it's, it's a short yeah. list, huh? It, it is, but at the same time, I mean, I think I would probably add on Kyburn. We've not seen that he's uh, sort of been using these passageways, but it's the kind of thing that, as the new Master of Whisperers, effectively, he will he will start to figure this stuff out in the same way that Varys did. So I think that That's we can point, probably yeah. add, add him to that list. Yeah. Um, the way I view it, actually, is that you say it's a short list. I actually think for uh, what is supposed to be like the closely guarded secrets to how to sneak in and around the palace of the king or queen or whatever, that's quite a long list. If we have <laughs> Varys <laughs> and I, uh, probably Kyburn, Littlefinger, Sansa may have an idea, Tyrion's probably got an idea, Jamie may have a bit of an idea. You, you're already talking about over half a dozen people who have got some idea of what's going on there. Mm, um, yeah. Which I think we'll we'll sort of develop a little bit in a moment when we're talking about who has been down uh, in these tunnels it's probably worth just saying now though that these tunnels and i would agree with you that they probably weren't all dating from magor's time but they have a number of purposes one of these purposes is just moving around from one place to another quite quickly another purpose seems to be for um spying on people so this is the kind of thing that Varys would often do and be like listening in on conversations and the rest of it and another one is this uh, a means of escape so there, there's lots of and, and obviously if you have a means of escape you've also got a secret way in um, <laughs> so uh, you there are lots of different purposes for these uh, yeah. tunnels and I guess we should add one more to the list or perhaps a group to the list is the little birds. I mean, we don't know a whole lot about them, but we know they're human beings yeah. and we know that their tongues have been cut out, which which might make it difficult for them to reveal any of the secrets they've captured. They may be uh, they communicate in ciphers and perhaps those ciphers are only understandable by Varus and Illyria, which would keep them which actually would keep that secret fairly well locked down. But if not, if there's any leeway there then maybe the there's a chance that someone could communicate with one of them but i really like this what you're saying too which is that that is a lot of people to know especially people who have agendas uh against the ruling regime especially right now and i mean frankly if if it was done right i could imagine a lot of men being led through those tunnels to make some sort of assault on the king from within like imagine varus leading like 50 uh, swordsmen through those tunnels. I, I don't see any reason why that couldn't happen, you know? Um, I, I agree. And, and let, let's do Varus then. So he is, I think we'd probably both agree, the person who knows the most about these tunnels. Yeah. And in the books at this point, he's sort of, he went missing basically for a little while um, after the, the murder of Tywin. Um, and it seems that he has, at least for some of this, been hanging around in the Red Keep in these tunnels, just uh, keeping on top of things. Yeah. And he appears in uh, the last chapter, the epilogue of A Dance with Dragons, um, and he comes uh, to assassinate uh, Kevin Lannister, who uh, was, um, uh, I mean, I feel a little bit sorry for Kevin Lannister, because basically Varys gives him this this little speech that says, the only reason I'm killing you is because you're competent. Uh, I don't, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just like, you, you, were, you were doing things too well, um, so I have to get rid of you, sorry about that. Uh, and then Pycelle, who he doesn't really give any, reasons for other than just yeah well why not uh but he uh, he appears <laughs> he up wasn't and, doing a good job <laughs> uh, yeah and and the, the the little birds as you say they're also there as well so he is almost certainly given the fact that he is sort of paving the way it would seem for this invasion by 
Fagon, uh, young Griff, who's going to be, surely at some point, is going to be uh, coming to attack King's Landing. How do you think Varys is going to be using this knowledge? Do you think he is going to try and sneak people in that way? Or, or is he going to do more assassinations? What do you think Varys' role with these tunnels is going to be, paving the way for an invasion? I think we're about to see perhaps peak Varus. It's interesting to consider his role in the story because everyone sees him as such a big, important character. And they're not wrong. I would totally agree that he's a very big, important character. But even before vanishing after Tywin's death, Varus plays very little role in A Storm of Swords, which is a, you know, a really huge, important book. Uh, his The most of his machinations are in the first two books, and then he's kind of He's really off page quite a lot in A Storm of Swords. And I think this is his moment to really enter the re-enter the spotlight and do quite a lot. So to answer your question, I think he's going to do a lot of those things, maybe all of the above. I think he's going to use a lot of his political capital, a lot of making a lot of moves because he really wants to get Fagon to be beloved. He understands the value of popularity and of consensus. And he's very good at manipulating that. And he's been working to undermine the Lannisters for a long time, uh, going back to getting rid of uh, good people like Barristan the Bold and trying to keep good knights like Balon Swan off of the Kingsguard, little things like that to bigger things that we're that don't really need to be repeated because Varus has been working these angles for so long. And so I could see, yes, assassinations, absolutely well. We've already seen that. So why not a few more, right? <laughs> and leading men in, perhaps subterfuge, just getting King's Landing primed to accept King Aegon, I think is really important to show him as a hero, to spread the word, which he's really good at doing that too, through his various networks of communication of getting people to like him and accept him and to, to view him as a hero, which is already, we know that's their plan. They've been raising him in secret. They want him to save the realm from the Dothraki to that's been their plan from the beginning to paint him as a hero and raise him to rule, rule really well. So I feel like that is for him, his great big long planning with Illyrio that's taken over almost a generation to come to a head is now really hitting its key moment. Aegon has invaded with his army. He's taken Storm's End. King's Landing can't be far behind. And so Varys is, this is his time to shine. He's got to do all these things that he's been building his whole life up to doing. And the Red Keep is a place he's mastered. So I feel like it's ripe for him to do his best or his worst, however you want to look at it. So it's, it's, I'm getting excited just talking about it because it really, for him, it's really all built up to this. This is the King he's supported since, since he was a baby or since the King was a baby, <laughs> not Varus himself, obviously. And it's now it's happening. So it, yeah, it's really exciting. <laughs> it is. And I think the thing I would pick up on there particularly is this idea you said about him spreading information because for the entire time, he's been keeping this quiet, this idea that, you know, whether or not you believe this really is actually Aegon Targaryen, I don't. I think this is actually probably a Blackfire pretender. Uh, but whether or not you believe that this is, he's been keeping this quiet. This is somebody who's been raised in secret. The moment that uh, Aegon Fagon arrives on Westeros is the moment everything changes. The com communications plan, the comms plan, if we were talking in today's lingo, ab completely changes up a gear because suddenly, from this point where he's you know, towing the party line that, yes, baby Aegon was killed all that time ago, he has to change it to, ha, I magically uh, took this baby out and saved this baby, and now it's grown into this fine young man here who's this wonderful ruler. That is the, the big thing that everybody needs to be told about. Now, personally, I think that he is going to be helped by the fact that Cersei is going to do something crazy, whether it's the <laughs> exact same thing um, that uh, she did on the show, blowing up the Sceptre, Baylor, it's possible, uh, but uh, in any event, what Varys did when he came up through those tunnels and he killed Kevin Lannister, he he does he does classic uh, evil villain monologuing, and he sort of like <laughs> gives, 
gives this uh, and this is this is my plan. And he basically says, and you know what, uh, uh, the uh, Cersei's going to be blaming the Tyrells for it, and and then he like moves off to these other things, and you just actually yes, she will. Of course, she's going to blame the Tyrells for killing uh, um, Kevin Lannister, and what's she going to do about it? Well, she is going to try and be like. Tywin, like fa her father was, and if you kill a Lannister, then I have to kill you. That is where she's going to go. So she is going to try and kill the Tyrells. I think that is now baked into the plot, and I think that when she does that, probably in some big way, like blowing up the Scepter Baelor, which would also eliminate the problem of uh, of the. Um, uh, the, the 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 faith militant and all the rest of it, so that would kind of make sense in a book perspective. The moment she does that, she's killing innocent civilians all over the place. It is a lot lot easier for someone like Varys to start spreading this this line. You know what? All these Lannisters, they're no good for us. <laughs> We should go back to those wonderful Targaryens. And hey, wouldn't you know it, there is one of them left and he's coming here in just a few <laughs> weeks' time. And, and that is that is how I see that's there. Do you think, though, that uh, sort of to move on from how Varys might do that, do you think that there is a, a way that Cersei might also be either hiding when King's Landing falls, as I, I'm going to assume you broadly agree with me that it will fall, mm -hmm. uh, in her either hiding or escaping out through these tunnels. Yeah, that's a great question. And I also like that you brought up the the faith militant and how that's becoming a problem again, because that is really history coming full circle. Magor's biggest problem was with the faith militant. That is a big part of why the Red Keep was built with these additions, with Magor's Holdfast, that is who he was initially most worried about. In fact, Red, the Red Keep was stormed by the Faith Militant in Aenys' day. And this was before Magor's Holdfast was built, so there weren't all these extra protections. So now that the Faith Militant is rearmed and headed to being very anti-Cersei, <laughs> I mean, they're, I mean, not headed to, they're already very hmm. anti-Cersei, let's be honest, they've They've already had the walk and all her you know, crimes were put on display, et cetera. So I think that we might be right back to that. And she may have to, if she has to flee the Red Keep, it might be because of, it might be just because of Aegon's men, but it might be the faith militant that gets there first because they're already inside the city and they may just decide that's the king for them. And if they're already inside the city, then they're just going to go right for the throat. And meaning Cersei's, <laughs> but I don't think Cersei's throat will be uh, taken by them because I do think she has to die at Jamie's hand. And that does imply she escapes and it might be through the tunnels, which I'm very curious about how that could happen because Varys is going to be aware of this possibility that she could escape that way. And if Varys doesn't want her to escape, well, maybe that's our answer. Maybe Varys does want her to escape. Maybe Varys is perfectly happy with Cersei continuing to lead the Lannisters until they're completely in the <laughs> toilet. <laughs> After all, he is the reason she's back in charge by killing as we, as you led into the section with the death of Kevin. So why Varus leaving her alive does actually make some sense because he, he would allow her to continue to muck things up. Yeah. I think he will allow her to, to stay there for a time until the person he wants on the throne has got the throne. I think after that, perhaps he might want to get rid of her. But just uh, on that, uh, the, the Magor point in the Faith Militant, what did Magor do, of course? He waited for the Faith Militant to be gathered in one place, and then he just burned them all. Um, is that some kind of uh, a sort of a nod to what's going to be happening with Cersei and how she deals with the Faith Militant? It's possible. Um, but let's uh, let's go on. So we've we, we've got that bit there, and I think we'll come on to the the red keep slightly further onto the story uh, just later on. But let's also look at one of the other Lannisters who has been using these tiles. We touched on it already, Tyrion. Mm -hmm. Now, Tyrion um, has got, and we're, George R. R. Martin's always dropping these kind of like historical, legendary kind of like uh, bits of foreshadowing or figures who. Uh, sort of echo backwards and forwards through time. Tyrion obviously is that has got this echo of Lan the Clever, who uh, legendarily uh, snuck his way into uh, Casterly Rock, sort of 
squeaking his way through sort of like gaps in the rock and, and along tunnels and he spent a long time in these different tunnels. Do you think that that implies, yes, there might be an element of that you know, Castle Rock itself. Do you think that that implies anything more for Tyrion in the Red Keep? Because we've already seen him once, as you've already pointed out. He, es he, he escaped, he was ha helped out from his cell, and then he used these tunnels to go and he killed Shay and his father. Do you think there's more for him there, given the fact that he probably has some vague idea about these tunnels and where they might be? Yeah, I do. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting because, like you say, it's a bit of a conundrum. I don't think that Tyrion's tunnel knowledge will be so important both at the red keep and at casterly rock although it's mm. definitely possible um i'd say that it's more likely one or the other and this is part of george's perhaps craft and the way he prepares this story he gives himself options he may have at one point not decided which route he would take, but he gave himself the ability to use either of these sort of tunnel systems as a plot line by setting it up that way. I feel like King's Landing is a lot more important. On the other hand, King's Landing could be in such a different state by the time Tyrion has any opportunity to arrive there. After all, we have the possibility of some sort of wire, wildfire accident or not accident, just a wildfire explosion that may happen before Daenerys and her people have taken any control of the city whatsoever. So that would imply Tyrion wouldn't, there'd be no reason for him to need to go into those tunnels um, if Daenerys just takes the city by force and, and perhaps blows up the Red Keep with a dragon. I, I, you know, these are all just options. They don't necessarily have to happen just because they happen on the show, obviously. So there's a lot of options there, a lot of possibilities that it's it's really hard to get into. So you, you've pointed to a conundrum, which is that there's two forks in the road here. It's kind of hard to imagine both, but not entirely impossible. So it's almost like we have three options. It could be one, it could be two, it could be both. And I haven't convinced myself either way. Having just said these things out loud, I, I don't think I've gotten any more certainty. <laughs> it still feels like both are possible. I'm curious what you think is more likely out of the two, or, or if you think maybe both are possible. Uh, well, I think both are possible. I mean, I think that the broad shape, just sort of extrapolating on a little from what we've already agreed, is that uh, Aegon is going to take over King's Landing at some point. And yeah. Cersei, I think, will escape. Now, the logical place for her to escape to is Casterly Rock. Uh, so I think that she's probably going to hand, this is what we know that we're going to see some Casterly Rock at some point, and I suspect this is how we're going to see it, is that she's going to end up back at Rock. So when Daenerys arrives, firstly, we have to be very clear, this is going to be a very different kind of invasion from the invasion we saw on the show, because on the show, uh, they bundled together everybody who was invading at any point and sort of put them into one massive fleet. But she is not going to have all of the, uh, the support there that was uh, uh, on the show in the books. It's going to right. feel a lot more like a foreign invasion. She's going to have Dothraki, yes. She's going to have Unsullied, yes. Um, uh, she will probably steal Victarion's boats, uh, yep. <laughs> and so she'll probably have some uh, ironborn boats, but she won't have lots of ironborn there. Uh, and she will probably have a few uh, SOZ sellsword companies with her as well. So it's going to feel a lot more like a foreign invasion, and she almost certainly won't have Dawn on her side. The Tyrells are probably not going to be there with her. So it is going to feel very different. But anyway, when she arrives, Tyrion is probably going to be in some sort of advisory position. Um, whether he's Hand of the Queen, not sure. I think probably, but you, know, you could go a couple of ways with that. Um, and she probably will um, place herself on Dragonstone and have the equivalent of that sort of planning meeting that they had saying, well, what do I do now? Um, I, I have to take the Red Keep. I have to take King's Landing at some point. What are my options? Tyrion, I'm sure, will say, well, I think there are some back routes there because that's how I got out. So I think that he probably will suggest it. But I think that it's also um, equally likely that, that he could go over to Castley Rock and that would be the way in there. Now, of the two, 
I sort of err uh, more towards the King's Landing option simply because I think that Castley Rock is going to be largely a sideshow. Uh, I think that that's going to be where Cersei goes. And I suspect that that may well be the scene of some quite important um, things going on with her and Euron, perhaps meeting up and planning and all the rest of it. But I don't think that this is Tyrion's role here is not to be retaking Casterly Rock because uh, that's not the priority for Daenerys. Her, her priority will be to take um, King's Landing and the supporters of the, whoever's in King's Landing, which is probably going to be Dawn um, and at least some parts of the Reach, the Stormlands, places like that. Yeah, I would agree. So with that. yeah. that's that's my my rough take on that one. Um, but let's come to one other person, and I know this is we we were talking briefly before we went on air. This was someone that you've you've done some thinking about, mm -hmm. who has definitely been exploring through these tunnels of uh, the Red Keep all the way back in Book One, uh, which is Arya. Now we mm -hmm. saw her there. Um, she was doing all of this kind of like chasing cats and, and all the rest of it. So we had that scene when she is sort of hiding inside a dragon's mouth and, and, and overhearing conversations and she gets lost and makes her way outside and all the rest of it. So she knows stuff. What, well, I'll just throw to you. I know, just give, give me your thoughts on what this means for the plot, the fact that she does know that there are tunnels there. Okay, so George is set up a lot with this. It's one of those things that he may now not decide to use, but it's it's been set up so long ago because, as you say, this is pretty early in a Game of Thrones. I think it's Arya's second or third chapter where she goes into these tunnels, and uh, maybe her fourth at latest. But she only has like five chapters in the first book, so it can't be that far in. And what's interesting about it is how much time she spends down there, and the thought she has down there, and then how her plot line brings back a lot of those elements, like things that happen in her chapters, recall some of these events, and then even more. We have events from history that remind us of some of the potential that's laid out for the future. And Arya is at the center of that, in my opinion. So to start off, we go back to the Dance of the Dragons when we had the incident of Blood and Cheese, which was when two men, one of whom was the rat catcher. So back then, the rat catchers knew the tunnels, or at least some of them did, uh, along with, you know, a few of the insiders. It's kind of strange to think that Magor and a couple people, and then a couple rat catchers know. It's like, yeah, well, that's kind of strange. That's kind of a leak, isn't it? <laughs> and indeed, it was a leak because that uh, this this rat catcher and this thug were hired to murder one of the princes which is exactly what they did. In response, rat catchers were banned from the city. Now, when Arya go, and they were replaced with cats. Now in Arya's chapter where she goes into the tunnels, what leads her into these tunnels is a cat. In fact, a cat that was quite possibly belonged to young uh, Rhaenys Targaryen who was murdered as a seven-year-old. So, this same cat that hates Lannisters, by the way, <laughs> leads her down into the tunnels. She gets lost in the darkness. And eventually she's able to find her way out, in part because she encounters Varys and Illyrio. And she's able to see some things because of their torch. And she's able to find her way back out. And while she's down there, she has lots of thoughts of fear, but starts to master it. And she also is, sees these dragon skulls. And the fact that the dragon skulls are down there are very symbolic because... The dragons are resting, you know, waiting to return again. It kind of suggests that. But it also suggests that they're part of the danger of the place and part of what needs to be taken care of and potentially what she has to face. Because if she's returning to the Red Keep or if anyone is returning to the Red Keep, it may be the Targaryens that are in charge of it. Whether it's a true Targaryen in Daenerys or a fake one in Aegon, or maybe both, um, not at the same time, but <laughs> you know, maybe they'll both have control of it at different times. So if we jump forward in Arya's arc, uh, or actually before that, when she tries to get back in the Red Keep, she shows up at the front door and the two guards don't recognize her because she's disheveled and looks like a commoner, kind of a recurring theme with Arya, not looking like a Stark or a noble girl. And that's just fine with her because it enables her to be sneaky and, and go unnoticed especially by people like, say, Ruth Bolton. <laughs> but um, she uh, 
they tell her who's yours. Like she says, I want to see my father. And they say, well, who's your father? The city rat catcher. And that when I reread that line after doing a lot of studying on the dance of the dragons, that was, it really stood out to me because well, there, <clears throat> there aren't any rat catchers. <clears throat> so it's kind of a funny reference. And if she's the one that goes back through the tunnels, it's been so well set up by not just that comment, but by the fact that she's been in there. But the question is, how would she navigate her way back through? And we've been given that answer as well. What is happening to Arya at the end of her Dance of Dragons arc? She's starting to skin change other animals, most notably a cat. <laughs> and so if she's go, if she goes back to Westeros, well, what about, I don't need to say if, when she goes back to Westeros, if she goes to King's Landing, and we can see why she might, there's people on her list in the Red Keep right now, and there will probably be people on her list in the Red Keep later. There, uh, it's, it's important to remember that her list is a good bit different and longer in the books, and there's people in the show that were killed that are still alive in the books, so she can still go out, like, like say, Marin Trant or even the mountain or Cersei, although I think that's less likely. But the point is, most of her list is at King's Landing right now, <laughs> or in the Red Keep right now. And not to mention her list could grow. Uh, for example, a person that I could see her targeting is Varus himself, given uh, what side he's on and given the activities he's engaged in vis-a-vis -vis child slaves. I don't think Arya would like that too much. Heck, nobody likes that too much. Uh, so, and Arya is already shown that she is willing to deliver justice when she sees fit. She killed Darian for deserting the Night's Watch, even though that's got nothing to do with her other than her brother Jon Snow being a, a fellow Black brother and Lord Commander. So, uh, and of course, she's taken vengeance in her own hands at, at the in her in the Mercy chapter. So. Tying all this back together again is another bit, which is that Visenya, the person who uh, perhaps is most responsible or secondarily most responsible for these tunnels existing in the first place, is the original wielder of Dark Sister. And I think a lot of us are uh, have a theory or at least the idea that maybe Arya will be the one to end up wielding Dark Sister, partly because of her name. <laughs> and also because in the show, she gets the cat's paw dagger, which... Maybe that's a substitute for Dark Sister in the books. I don't I don't know, but it, it, it's possible. So there's just a lot of circumstantial evidence and reason to believe Arya could return to the Red Keep because of who's on her list. She's got the means to go through the tunnels. She's got cats to help her find her way that she can skin change through. She's cat of the canals in one of her chapters. I mean, this is just, there's so much here. She thinks about cats being, here's a quote from uh, the Mercy chapter. It's, it's not spoilery, so don't worry about that. In the fog, all cats are gray, Mercy thought. In the fog, all men are killers. She's already thinking about cats and killing and being a cat and a killer cat and things like that. So I don't know. This is it's still a theory, but there's if, if any of this evidence registers with you, maybe I've converted a, a couple more people to my uh, to this this headcanon of mine. And but we'll just have to wait and see, won't we? <laughs> we will. And and when I I love it as the the fact that Arya knows, I I've been pretty sure that she will uh, go back there uh, through the tunnels. And uh, I'm always wary of using the show as evidence, particularly. But there was one scene that I thought kind of showed what I, is going to be in Arya's mind mm. when she gets back to Westeros, which was that scene when she's at the end of the crossroads, and, and we remember it's, it's the hot pie scene and all the rest of it. Uh, but she sort of sits on her horse there, and she kind of like looks one way and the other and decides to go north. And that, yeah. I think, is quite an important point, because that is what is going to go on in her mind. When she gets back to Westeros, she's got two things really two possible drives one is to get back to her family she'll she'll hear you know john snow's there alive oh maybe she'll hear about sansa suddenly appearing and then rickon maybe yeah uh, on something that there, there will be this sudden this actually i can go home feeling and the other thought is that i've got this kill list and we know that that is dear to her heart it's her prayer she repeats it time after time uh and as you very rightly say most of that list is down in king's landing so she will be faced with this choice where does she go and i think that the answer is that she will go first up to winterfell 
join in with whatever's happening up there. And then at the end of it, she will be, um, and again, we shouldn't take it exactly as it was on the show, but this idea that she is one of those people who's going to descend down on King's Landing at the end to finish it, tie off all of the sort of the, the loose ends of this, uh, get rid of the final baddies, all of that kind of stuff. And she will go in the way that she knows how to get in. I really means, agree. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and there's one other piece that maybe it doesn't matter that much, but it fits with what I was saying too, about the possibility of her acquiring dark sister. seems like if she does that, it's gotta be in the North. She's not going to acquire dark sister at King's Landing or something. That seems weird. She'd have to go up there, get involved in the battle against the others and all that. And maybe that's when it, it passes from say Mira's hand or Bran's hand or Hodor, or I don't know, to her, uh, if that's even going to happen. It would happen in the North, I think. So I, I totally agree with you. I think that's more important for her. I think family is more important to her than revenge. But I think they're both important to her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and for those who missed the Dark Sister reference, this was actually this was a, a History of Westeros exclusive from a couple of years ago, wasn't it? It was I think it was a share rather than yourself who asked George R. R. Martin uh, just to confirm that Bloodraven took dark sister with him the sword with him up to the wall uh, and he did yeah it sounds like a minor detail but uh people like us that's uh, that's massive information yeah um, the, the crowd at that uh live event when there was an auto me being perhaps the loudest of all when george just he didn't <laughs> he didn't uh he didn't bat an eye basically he just said yes i mean he he at first he couldn't hear the question right and then when he heard it right he said yes it was a very clear there was no no like mincing around no hmm, maybe i don't know he just yes <laughs> so we all like looked at each other like oh and and of course we got a recording of it so there's there's proof <laughs> <laughs> excellent and uh, uh although i believe it's it's down on one of the wikis i saw as a semi-canonical source which is so yeah. th there you are uh, uh all right se semi-canonical semi source here, here we go <laughs> uh, uh, um so uh but this means that probably given the fact that we've not heard of it being at the wall in castle black or anything that he took it up with him when he went north of the wall so it's probably in that cave somewhere and probably it's going to return uh when bran and uh, and mira come back down it's that there was this th brief moment on the show when uh, they kind of like lingered, the shot lingered on, on Mira picking up a sword and carrying it with her, um, which is the kind of thing that they used to do on the show just to sort of do a nod to say, this is important in the books, but yeah. we haven't got time to explain it here. Uh, like they <laughs> lingered on the Horn of Winter and they lingered on the Sword Dawn and things like that. Um, mm. So it's almost certain, I think, that Mira will come down with it and then it's a question of who uses that in the north and i think i is a good i mean i think Mira yeah would be I'm, useful with it herself but yeah, yeah I is, I is, uh, as good a bet as any it's it's so <laughs> much like needle in a lot of ways and mira prefers her net and try a spear so yeah i mean you're right mira could wield it but you're right also that it seems more likely uh, a fit for aria yeah Excellent. Okay, so uh, we're, we're moving slightly away from the Red Keep secrets there, but uh, that was a good, good, good little digression. Dark um, Sister wants to go home to the Red Keep too. <laughs> I think, and I think that's entirely fair because Blackfire, as we're off on a digression, I, I suspect for very long and complicated reasons, but I suspect that that will reappear um, in uh, the Winds of Winter and be presented to Aegon, uh, Fagon, um, as a sort I of a... An attempted, proof. Yeah, yeah. And an attempted proof that he is the rightful king. Uh, and so it makes sense if both of these Targaryen swords end up back down in the Red Keep. Um, okay, let's uh, just, in terms of the Red Keep, thinking a little bit further forward, we've already talked about the uh, what is likely to happen in probably the first half or so of the Winds of Winter. Um, Broadly speaking, uh, Varys is going to be causing huge amounts of problems within the Red Keep using those tiles we're talking about. Uh, Aegon's going to come and uh, launch his uh, attack and almost certainly take over control. Cersei's probably going to do something crazy, but Cersei's probably going to escape. So we will have Aegon, Fagon in place in the Red Keep um, at some point in the Winds of Winter. Yes. You did... However, just sort of drop in partway through this, you sort of said, yeah, there's the potential for there being some sort of wildfire 
accident before Daenerys arrived, because that's the next big thing that's going to happen. Is Daenerys yeah. or during Daenerys? Or during? Yeah. yeah. Um, now, uh, what what's what's your speculation on this? Why do you think that might be what's going to happen? Well, if we the, the the trick is that we know there's or are pretty sure there's some sort of wildfire accident uh, going to happen. The, the the circumstances are tricky, but. The idea that it could happen under Daenerys makes a lot of sense if she's bringing dragon fire to the city. And if she's, you know, nothing like the show, just hitting a few key spots, all it would only take one of these caches being set off to cause humongous damage to the city that could then be blamed on her rather than, you know, which is not necessarily, would necessarily be fair, but would make sense given how information travels and how blame gets assigned. Um, so I think that also because, uh, she may also go North first before this is all taken care of. And thus that would imply potentially the King, whether it's Aegon or if it's somehow Cersei is still there, has had more time to prepare their defenses, uh, against Queen Daenerys, which is exa also exactly what we saw in the TV show, which again, we don't have to take that as, uh, necessarily going to happen. But it is interesting to consider that while Daenerys goes north in the show, Cersei is off hiring the Golden Company and things like that. And it just so happens that Aegon, <laughs> Fagon, is the man in control of the Golden Company. So we could just be substituting who's in charge at, at King's Landing when Danny finally comes back there to take it. So I think uh, for for reasons of how the the kingdom the ruler at the end i think is more likely to be resolved after the defeat of the others it's hard to pick who's going to rule westeros while the whole continent is still engaged in a struggle for life and death so i do think that what the show gave us from that high point makes sense that they will decide the future of westeros after the others are defeated and it, whether daenerys um you know her if she dies at some point defeating the others or afterwards well that's a tr that's tricky as well, but I think it uh, for a lot of reasons it seems to make sense to go roughly in that order. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that certainly the deciding on the future monarch will be a, 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 at the end of this story. Um, yeah, I I talk quite a lot about the the, the scouring of the Shire because this is what George R. R. Martin talks about. This is the penultimate chapter of the Lord of the Rings, um, and when he says, you know, a lot of people quote me on this ending of A Song of Ice and Fire is going to be bittersweet. He doesn't just end there. He says, mm -hmm. he gives example. He says, bittersweet like The Lord of the Rings is bittersweet, mm. um, which is an entirely different subject on all of that. But then he says even more detail about what he means by that. And he says, the second to last chapter of The Lord of the Rings, The Scouring of the Shire, he says, if you want to know the feel of the end of A Song of Ice and Fire, that's the feel I'm going for. So uh, mm. that there are many, many layers to this, that, but I think that the one of them is very clearly in The Scouring of the Shire, but it wasn't in the films, but the hobbits come back to the Shire at the end of it all. The, the um, not the big baddie, but the sort of the second baddie is is there and they have to just root him out before they can kind of reclaim the the, the land for themselves so it's it's that that's the kind of the feel that we've got going on so it's yeah it, it's like uh having got rid of the big baddie you then come back home and discover that actually the secondary baddie is is in your home and, you and it's have gotten to stronger in the meantime. Yeah, that does fit really well. Yeah. So in, you, in this metaphor, you're saying the Shire is basically King's Landing and the big entrenched second baddie is whichever King is uh, holding up things afterwards. That does well, fit very well. Yeah. <laughs> I would, I, my, my, I, I go a or couple of different ways on this one. <laughs> I think, I think Fagon will actually die before this. Okay. I think yeah, I could see that. Daenerys will head up at, once she thinks that's it, I'm now in control, that's the point at which she'll feel that she can then go and head up and help out in whatever battle there is at, with ah. the others. And then we have to cut back to who's our second big baddie that we've got going on here. Actually, that's probably Euron and Cersei if they've teamed up. Yeah, Where are they going to... That might be the time that they could come back in. Now, I kind of oscillate between the, uh, the idea of uh, that they would 
go back into King's Landing or maybe they would set themselves up in Harren Hall. There, there's quite a lot of sort of foreshadowing that I'm sure I wouldn't have to tell you about, about the mm -hmm. idea of like uh, one-eyed renegades and Harren Hall and, and dragon fights and things above, uh, above the lake. Uh, so I think there's a possibility they might be there, but I think that that is where I would go as a sort of a, an, an ending point. Yeah, I um, agree with that. Yeah, especially the the God's Eye bit, uh, you're on one eye, aim in one eye. That's just so <laughs> on a dragon. Yeah. yeah, that just fits too well. It's picture Night King taking a lot of taking you're on taking Night King's role as a dragon rider <laughs> and the, the long and short of it, the short version. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. As I say, I, I, I talk about that. I, I, huge amounts of details. If you're interested, go and have a look at some of my other videos. Hopefully they'll be uh, intuitively titled. Um, but I want to just do one more thing, talk about one more thing here, connected sure. to the Red Keep, uh, which is one of my uh, favorite tinfoily theories about uh, about the Red Keep, which is the Iron Throne uh, has a character and mm. uh, actively cuts and hurts and maybe even kills uh, bad or wrong rulers. Ooh. Now, the this is new to me. Uh, there was it. Okay. Well, so the 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 logic goes that uh, clearly the, the 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 big bad ruler that we've been talking about is Magor, and he died on the Iron Throne. It's stabbed by the Iron Throne. Uh, then you go back and you say, um, actually, lots of other people have got. Uh, wounds from the Iron Throne. Uh, there was uh, Rhaenyra, of course, who she had lots of cuts from it, and she was, whether or not you think that she was rightfully the queen, um, she was written out of history as being a, a false queen. Uh, you get Joffrey, who gets cut by it, um, and you get a lot of these, these uh, kings and monarchs who, uh, who get cut by it, uh, who perhaps yeah. are the worst ones or the 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 wrong ones? Joffrey obviously shouldn't be sitting there. Um, and then you also get this intriguing moment where you get Aegon the Conqueror himself, Aegon the First, who once does cut himself on mm -hmm. the Iron Throne when he gets this letter from Dawn, which is clearly about um, the fate of his beloved sister, and he grips it so tightly that it bleeds his hand bleeds so what uh that's a massive in sort of instances do you think any of this adds up to anything or is this just telling us that this is a really uncomfortable chair <laughs> well i think it's both i mean i think part of it too is that it's symbolic of how you have to rule um and it's a it's a con condemnation of monarchies that that throne is bloody in all ways the way it was made what it represents and yeah the people sitting on it whether they're made worse by it by it or whether it makes them worse uh or whether they make it worse and yeah so it's it might be some sort of like george giving it a vague personality in order to make statements like that and to show that because George very clearly is not a fan of monarchy. Not that that's any big, <laughs> big uh, controversial statement, but uh, he does takes a lot of puts a lot of effort into showing the flaws of 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 that system and the type of awful people that get put in charge. So, yeah, I kind of like it symbolically as they in order to to keep that power. Someone like Magor has to do these awful things. I mean, in order to keep the throne, the first thing he did is built these torture chambers and this 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 these secret tunnels that he knew he would have to escape his enemies or potentially have to escape his enemies because he knew that he was going to do awful things to them. <laughs> so, yeah, I like the idea. It's neat uh, from a symbolic way. As far as the actual supernatural behind it, uh, I'm not quite as sold on that, but I like the idea because it's because it's it's uh, it fits with certain other stories we've had and and the concept of of giving personality to. Uh, powerful items is certainly out there in fantasy um so yeah I, I, that's pretty cool though i like the idea that's neat and, and i love the iron throne in general it's it, it really is just such a great creation by george um as both a symbol and as a piece of art and as a as a concept 
Yeah, and as a concept, so I, I, I think I would agree with you that I, I love the idea of the Iron Throne, this anthropomorphized Iron Throne that is killing kings that it doesn't like. I don't quite buy into that. Uh, but this symbol that if you sit on the throne, uh, it will hurt you because it is a bloody affair ruling the Seven Kingdoms. And the Iron Throne itself is a symbol of conquest. This is this is the the melted down swords of those who who uh, bent the knee to Aegon the Conqueror. So that is what it is, and I think that yeah. and this is where the um, Aegon, Balerion, and Daenerys uh, and Drogon kind of uh, symmetry works. Is that uh, he invaded with three dragons? She's invading with three dragons, um, and Drogon and Balerion are clearly. <clears throat> Um, uh, sort of uh, deliberately made very similar. Valerian, his fire was what forged that, and I think we're probably going to see Drogon's fire is what is going to melt it in the end. So I think that that is going to symbolically show the beginning and end of this Targaryen rule. I like it. Uh, <laughs> is there anything else while we're on the Red Keep? Any other secrets that you just want to wow us with? Yeah, two quick points that I think we might want to be aware of. One just uh, factor about the Red Keep, one thing about its construction, one historical uh, example. So I'll start with the small one, which is that a it's been mentioned several times that there uh, are traps uh, in mm -hmm. these secret passageways. Whether they really are or that's just a way to scare people from exploring them, I don't know. But that is potentially something to consider when we are thinking about other people using these tunnels or using them to sneak in, or especially people who are less familiar with them than Varys. So that's something to consider that uh, traps could be uh, crucial. Um, maybe even someone like Kyburn, who is just learning about them, uh, might maybe randomly that could be a problem for him. Uh, but more likely, I think uh, the example that we get from the mo from Fire and Blood, I think is worth considering, which is, when Aegon III had his big dispute with his own regency, and we had this incident called the Secret Siege, where most of the realm was unaware this was even happening. The king was hiding in Magor's Holdfast with his wife, his brother, which meaning young Viserys, uh, the very young, and with some other of the Lyseni who were part of his in-laws, and then a particular interesting bodyguard by the name of Sandok the Shadow. Now, Sandok the Shadow to me is a bit of a parallel both to Sandor because of his name and to the mountain because he's silent and huge and deadly and uh, serves as a guard to a king a slash queen, both really, but mostly she was the protector of... Um, Viserys' Lyseni wife, who was later go later was the queen. And so uh, this incident that happens while they're, most of Westeros isn't, avail isn't aware of it is something that could have a history repeat itself kind of thing, where the mountain is Sandok the Shadow, Cersei is the one locked up inside the tunnel, uh, inside the Red Keep, whereas Fagon is taking control of the city, or someone else is taking control of the city. And maybe this is resolved by Cersei escaping, as we've discussed prior, uh, which is the secret siege eventually just kind of ended peacefully in, in the historical version. But there's a lot of little parallels here for potential for uh, something like that to happen again. And it's always, always pays to keep an eye out for uh, these historical parallels. Actually, I actually thought of one more. Um, there's two examples of someone being thrown out the window uh, from the Red Keep during the Dance of the Dragons. And in both cases, they were uh, one of the royal family, a young member of the royal family. And well, we see Tommen go out the window in the TV show. I don't think Tommen will jump because he's too young for suicide in the books, but he could be thrown uh, much in the same way. These young princelings, Prince Owen was a girl. No, they were both girls. Yeah, they were both girls. And uh, so that to me seems like it might be kind of very dark foreshadowing. Uh, for such an event. So <laughs> look out for that, y'all. Watch out, watch out for falling <laughs> princes and kings and queens. <laughs> yes, definitely something to look forward to. It's, it's only going to get darker, these books. We, we, we have to yeah. keep on reminding ourselves. Um, just on the Magos Holdfast, I think that that was really interesting because 
this is the way that this was designed was that this was a separate bit that Magor uh, added into the design. And it is a castle within a castle. So it's like, uh, if you imagine like a proper uh, sort of uh, a keep to a castle, sort of a classic Norman style keep, it's like that, but um, but more so. It's got incredibly thick walls. It's got its own dry moat with spikes at the bottom. Um, uh, it is uh, It is the place that you go and hide out um, even if the rest of the castle falls. And this does not have all of those tunnels going into it in the way that the rest of the Red Keep does. This is deliberately sort of kept isolated. So, um, yeah, it's it's slightly different to the rest of the Red Keep. That yeah. That's where they hang out during the uh, Battle of Blackwater. They feel really safe in there. Um. <laughs> yeah. And and they could they they thought that they could carry or survive there for a, a, a while longer, even if the rest of the castle... Fell. which would matter because right like you say that that is a really big deal because if stannis had taken the city if they could help hold out for a while then tywin could have come and maybe take the city back so that was that was super relevant because it wasn't just a, a vain hope that they could hide out for for what for what what were we gonna hide for but no they had a real a really good reason to expect that it would matter so it would that would have put a lot of pressure on anyone who who expects that we need to get rid of them. We need to break the siege before help arrives. And maybe that is something that uh, we could see happen also going forward. We'll see. Absolutely. Okay, uh, I think I'm gonna wrap this one up uh, there. Thank you, Aziz. This has been fascinating, just working our way through some of these uh, different secrets of the Wedkey. Why don't you remind people where they can find you on the internet? Right on. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. This was really fun. This is definitely not a topic I'd spent a ton of time thinking about. I've definitely thought about it, but more of these individual pieces. Like I thought about Arya's bit and I thought about Tyrion's bit. I never, never turned the focus around on the place rather than the people uh, individually and how they may interact with it. So this is, this has been really interesting for me as well. So, uh, where you can find me is history of Westeros is the name of my channel. We are on YouTube. We are on podcast, uh, any podcast catcher that you use. We are probably have a bigger presence there than YouTube. Although most of our episodes are on both. And like you mentioned at the start, we're also, we've started the podcast of surprise, which is a witcher pod. That's, um, also on YouTube on the Azora hype channel. And, on my uh, side of the podcast things, but we're all a team. So, and that's with Mikal Schick and Kyle Foster, if that wasn't, if we didn't say that before. <laughs> and what's next for History of Westeros is we're starting a Feast for Crows uh, on our Valar Reread Us journey. We've been rereading the books uh, several chapters at a time, once a week on Sunday, and we just finished A Storm of Swords, took a one week off, and now we're getting right back to it with a Feast for Crows. So that's going to be really fun because... Uh, the latter books, there's a lot more guesswork and figuring what's out rather than analyzing what's already happened. So that's uh, that's extra fun. So again, thanks for having me. And I look forward to uh, future uh, working together with you in the future. We always uh, seem to produce good stuff. Absolutely. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you on, as always. As I say, it's, uh, I only have people on this channel who I would highly recommend you go and check out their own stuff. And uh, Aziz uh, is, is one of the most knowledgeable people in the entire community you're too um, kind thank you much um, no <laughs> I'm, I'm just, you, <laughs> just just the right level of kind uh accurate <laughs> in this case i like to think um uh, but the links for those things are down in the description i'm going to make you disappear for just one moment so i can point at the screen uh which is to say uh if you like these uh conversations with other content creators about the secrets of westeros then you will find a link to other ones that i've done just around here in a few moments places like winterfell Peoples like the, the Faceless Men, uh, Old Valeria, I've um, uh, done a whole series of them. Uh, and if you're interested in either supporting this channel or getting access to some things that I do just for my patrons, uh, a few extra bonus benefits, then there's a link going up here somewhere around here, which is a link to my Patreon page. Uh, okay, uh, thank you so much once more, uh, Aziz, for coming on. Uh, take care, everyone, and I will see you next time. Bye.